This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome the show, Nora Finkscheidt. How are you doing, Nora? Hi, doing very well. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. I had the pleasure of watching uh, your new film, uh, your new Netflix film, the Unforgivable um, with San with Miss Sandra Bullock and an amazing cast, which we're going to get into all of that in a minute. But before we go down there, let's. I want to take it back for a little, a few years behind. And how did you get started in the business? What made you want to tell stories and, and be in this ridiculous business that we call the film industry? <laughs> right, um, which it is for sure. Um, it 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 started quite a while ago. I mean, when I was a teenager. Or even earlier, you know, um, when I watched movies, there was a point where I understood that, oh, actually, there are people behind that make choices, you know, <laughs> like I watched Titanic and <sighs> Jack died. And I was like, why the hell did they let him die? And it was, I don't know, 11. So I thought, like, if I could become a filmmaker, I could remake that film and, and he would survive, you know. Like that, it was when it started. Now, of course, I understand the whole movie wouldn't work if he survived. He right. has to die. Um, right. And I've been trying to tell that to my daughter, by the way, and she doesn't buy it. She's like, no, no, there was, you could have put a life, she could have got a lifeboat. There was more than enough room for both of them. I don't understand it. And she always goes, when Mr. Jim Cameron comes in your show, I would like to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> she's, yes. she's 10. She's 10. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was at exactly that same place. And, and ever since, you know, that kind of dream grew of becoming a filmmaker, but I do not come from an artistic background. So nobody in my family does anything related to art. So the idea of becoming a filmmaker was something pretty crazy. It's like, yeah, I want to be an astronaut, you know, <laughs> like, go right. to the moon, sure. So um, I first studied other things to make my parents happy, like, you know, I call it <laughs> Latin American studies, law. But in the meantime, I was always like, in, in secret, making short films and being in kind of an underground film school and working right. my way slowly up to longer forums. And yeah, that's how it started. Wow. Yeah. Isn't it? It's I, I call it the sickness, uh, the beautiful sickness that is to be a filmmaker. You just can't get it out. Once you get bit by the bug, it, it, it can't leave you. It can't. It just... Yeah. It's the bug that grows. It just grows. Sometimes it goes dormant for years, but then it always pops its head up. Always, yeah. always pops its head up. Now, how did you get your um, your film System Crasher off the ground? That was a first, was that your first feature? That was my first um, fiction feature. Okay. Um, it it was well. It took a while. It took six years to make that film, which wow. you know, it was kind of challenging to write the script and then, of course, to get it financed because. Who wants to see a movie about a terrible child? You know, it's not an easy pitch. So like, oh yeah, there are like child psychiatry wards involved, and then people are like, oh, nobody's gonna want to watch that. <laughs> um, so yeah, it took a lot of time. I made a documentary in Argentina in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um, that film won won two important prizes in Germany. Then all of a sudden, people were interested in the script, you know, and then at the end things fell into place and we could make the film. It was still a low budget film, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. for a first feature, but at least we raised enough money that we were able to do it in a small team. And and I have a lot of international listeners and I love your story because, I mean, you weren't raised in uh, downtown Los Angeles. Uh, you weren't no. anywhere near Hollywood. So you were as far away from Hollywood as humanly possible. Right. And, and yet somehow, you have, you know, you're, you have a couple of a couple of Oscar winning actors in your latest film and you've really kind of hustled your way out to get to where you have. What do you, what how do you think that happened? <laughs> like from from the idea of like, I want to be an astronaut to, you know, System Crasher and then System Crasher obviously won a lot of awards. It didn't it like sweep the German Oscars as well, yeah. the Lolas and. <laughs> I mean, and it, won, it didn't win the Berlin, it won a Berlin yeah. as well. What was that yeah. like? What is that like for you? I mean, I've never been in that situation, so I'd love to hear it from your side of it. How'd that feel? Well, pretty surreal. <laughs> but then, thankfully, it doesn't happen everything at the same time. You right. know? I mean, sometimes I look back. The other day, you know, I was walking with my husband through Venice, and we had been here to do a short film 
2013 with our son who by that time would be was he was two and we were like okay if somebody would have told us that eight years later you will be living with your son in LA who by that time speaks fluently English almost now better than German while directing a film you know with Sandra Bullock, Viola Davis, you know Vincent D'Onofrio, John Brundle <laughs> I would have think like yeah I want to take that drugs that you're on whatever <laughs> And, but that's the thing that's so fascinating because I mean I, I've I've said that to myself so many times in my life where like I if I would have like oh if I would have had this meeting with this actor or this producer I would have like if you would have told me that five years ago it'd be crazy you know or, or just being on this show being able to do this show I talked to my heroes that made movies when I was a kid and I'm like you know thank you for making the movies that made my childhood. If you would have told me, if you told the video store kid, <laughs> the guy who was working at the video store, like one day you're going to interview and talk for a couple hours with this this director, it's insane. But that's the but you have to start with the dream. You have to start with the dream, exactly. and that's where it kind of goes from there. Um, now, how did you? So I have to I have to find out how did you get from System Crasher? Obviously, you had a lot of awards, a lot of attention. Uh, did you just start getting noticed from Hollywood at that point? And then they started, you know, hey, why don't you come over here? <laughs> so, um, yeah, sort of. So um, Veronica Ferris, who is a German actress slash producer, uh, who co-produces a lot of films in Hollywood, she saw System Crusher at the Berlin Film Festival. And then she reached out and said, I really loved your film and I am co-producing a film over there um, which really somehow resonates with your film. And by the way, Sandra Bullock is playing the lead and Brad King is producing. Do you mind, do you want to take a look at the script? And I was like, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. But it was more that I was curious to read a Hollywood script. Right. And not yet realizing that there would be any chance that I would actually have to do something. Right. Involved in it, you know, it was more like, that would be cool to read. And then she was like, can I forward them your film? And I'm like, of course, sure. You know, and at that point I was still, I thought like, wow, if Sandra Bullock got to watch my movie and if the producer from The Departed watches my film, how amazing is that? Stop, you know, that, that was Those... until my, my, my expectations were. Sure. And that was, already, I consider that already a miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they saw the film, they, they reached out and said, we definitely want to meet you. And that is when things for me got really surreal. <laughs> Very surreal. <laughs> Even more surreal. That must have been that must have been remarkable. Like like you said, like it's insanity for like, why would they want me? Like that they yes. see my movie is just enough. Let alone so when you start getting these phone when you when you take that first meeting, because uh, I love I love hearing these stories. Uh, when you take that first meeting with with Sandra and, and Graham, how did that go? <laughs> like, did you still like, would you just like, I, why am I here? <laughs> well, I mean, the why am I here goes all the way through. You know, <laughs> it's not constantly there, but it hits you every time again. All of a sudden you're sitting in Hans Zimmer's studio who, who's composing the movie and you feel like, how did I get here, you know? Who was to, so crazy to hire me, you know? But um, so first I met Graham in London and there was a wonderful meeting. I mean, I was so nervous also because I wasn't used um, to communicating in English. So, right. so the layers of insecurity, not only like, why are we meeting actually, but how can I express my thoughts? But then we spoke about the movie two and a half hours, you know, we were exchanging ideas and thinking about comms and I was asking questions. I basically, I showed up with papers like this here um, and I had prepared questions in <laughs> case that I get too nervous, I could some, have something to hold. So I interviewed him That's and he amazing. was like, yeah, he was like, I love that, go on. You know, I think he probably usually does it the other way around. Sure. Uh, and then the next thing that was going to LA and meeting Sandy, and I mean, there was another, you know, the moment you, you step out of a car and you see Sandra Bullock's like, oh, all righty, another surreal moment. And that was the moment where I got really nervous. Then I realized, but then she came and she gave me a hug and she said in German, it's so cool that you're here. That's I love right. you. Yeah, she's Come German. In. 
you want to have a coffee, a cookie, and oof, you know, she's so likable and approachable and grounded right. that she makes it really easy for you to forget that she's Sandra Bullock. Now, when you're on set um, and you're directing Viola Davis, Sandra Bullock, Vincent D'Onofrio, John Brundle, uh, how do you... What is it like collaborating with that level of talent as far as, I mean, I mean, Hans Zimmer and all the other people on the on the behind the scenes as well. But but just as a director working with that caliber of actor, what is that experience like, especially for a, for a first time? You're not a first time director, but you were definitely a first time big Hollywood director. This is the first time you were on a Hollywood set and things like that. So what was that experience like? Um, again, thankfully, it doesn't happen everything <laughs> at the same time you know so when i when, when i got the job i didn't know who the cast would be we found them all together it was a process you know we started sure. with sandy who was um crazy enough and then you know we were talking about liz and we thought about viola and you know it was like a dream we didn't know if she would take on that part or not and and when she did, it was like, wow, you know, now next thing is like jump on the phone with Viola. So it happened step by step. And then, um, yes, they bring extremely um, a lot of experience and talent. But at the same time, you still make a movie together. So it's a little bit like cooking, um, but with bigger pots in a bigger kitchen, you know, hmm. Um so oh, yes, I'm kind of amazed. And sometimes I'm just watching, not even giving a, a, a lot of directions. But then comes the moment where you go like, oh, that scene isn't working or that dialogue isn't necessary or they run an idea by me or I have something. And then all of a sudden it goes back to normal and it's always like, almost like riding a bicycle. You know, it comes to something super, super simple and you forget the ho big Hollywood machine because it's like, What's the motivation of the character in that moment? Right. How do we translate it? And which words do we need? And which can we take away? What's the backstory of the character that makes him or her do that in that moment? And is it enough or not? And, um, and then it gets really comforting in a way because that is what all combines us. And each actor is different. One wants to hear a lot of thoughts and the other one's more like, no, 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 I'll just do it. And one has a lot of questions and the other not at all. And yeah, so it's with each individual actor a little different. A little a little bit different approach. Now, I, I know I've had this experience many times when I'm on set, um, the uh, imposter syndrome. Uh, the moment where you think, oh my God, security is gonna come and they're gonna figure out that I'm a fraud and that yeah. I don't belong here and at any moment, Security is going to, someone's going to go, wait a minute, what is, what is she doing here? Get her off the set. How often did that happen to you? <laughs> and how did you deal with it? Because it is a thing that a lot of directors, you know, we go through. Absolutely. All the time, basically. <laughs> you go through. It's a mixture. It's always there. You know, there, I once read, and that was a long time ago, a few filmmaker rules by Werner Herzog, you know, okay. where oh, yeah. it's like, and one of the rules was get used to the bear behind you. And I don't know what the heck he meant by that. I just know what I understood for it because I, re I, I can so well imagine that big bear behind me who is there when you write a script, when you, you know, talk to an actor for the first time, the bear that always says like somebody else could do that much better. That scene that you're writing, it's really not good. Oh God, look at that dialogue. You know, there is an inner voice yeah. and you have, it will never go away. And it might even grow where you have to, in a way, get used to it and embrace it right. and say, yes, there will come the moment, you know, when you work with a new editor for the first time and you have a, you know, he, he shows you something and you go like, wow, I'm working with Joe Walker. We haven't worked before. He just edited Dune, you know, and right. now comes Laura and gives some comments about his cut. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. You know, of course, that's like frightening. But then all of a sudden you start a dialogue and you feel that people are, I, I just felt so many amazing, you know, encounters with people on eye level that I have to be really grateful yeah, I mean, it sounds like you got to play with uh, a lot of toys, 
a lot yeah. of amazing people. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, Hans, I mean, what was, what is it, how is it working collaborating with Hans Zimmer? I have to ask you. Um, it's, it's also um, similar, like with Sandy. I mean, you meet an icon, but, but those guys, they make it so easy. So, and maybe again, it's the cultural connection, you know, I mean, I came in Hans's studio and then he, you know, I mean, that was already in Corona time, so we did not hug. But right. again, he said in German, like, welcome, so cool that you're here. What an amazing film. I just saw the cut, you know, let me show, I have an idea. And then all of a sudden, um, I said, well, Hans, you know, I'm not sure, like, you're, you're such a pro and it's very difficult to talk about music, you know, right. because sometimes you feel I'm not a professional magician, musician. How do I, um, convey, he, convey, yeah, convey. All right. Yeah. In a way that doesn't sound stupid. And then he said, Nora, there is, it's very easy to talk about music. It works or it doesn't work. And I prefer you tell me it doesn't work and we figure out together why. I don't need you to analyze the music or use musical terms, you know. I just right. want your gut reaction. I want it right away. And, well, that's easy then, you know. Right. So so it sounds like you almost had, you know, everybody you were collaborating with was almost a little bit of a master class. You were learning, you know, what was like, the, what? so that was a very big lesson you learned from from Hans. What was a big lesson you learned from working with the caliber of the talent that you were working with uh, in front of the scenes, your actors. Was there a lesson that you like, I didn't, I didn't know that before I walked on the set. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, what, what really amazed me um, with, in working with Sandy and preparing that role, like nothing that we chose um, as a team creatively is random. Like everything, every detail, you know, every question of, why are the colors in that house like this? And how do we represent the wealth of that one family, but more the kind of the middle class intellectual household of the other ones? And um, where is Ruth come from? And how can we express all her anger within a character that is so silent for such a long time? You know, when do we let it burst and everything? So sometimes, you know, um, the she would text me, I don't know, at midnight when we both had to get up at four in the morning and I was texting back and it's so so cool, you're still available. So the passion, you know, mm. that is in there and the choices that she made, like the how how daring she is to physically transform into a character that we would not expect from Sandra Bullock. Right. You know, it was a little thing that she put on her teeth to make the to change the teeth and make it slightly um, yellow and all those subtle changes that really make her look different, you know, like oh, yeah. how can I make it? That, that is what I learned, you know, that there are basically no limits. Yeah, she definitely doesn't look like the glamorous uh, Miss Congeniality uh, in, this, in this film. And it's so beautiful to see her because she's, she's such a tour de force as an actress. I mean, she is truly a tour de force uh, watching her and... And, and of course, the rest of the cast is remarkable, too. Now, I know no matter who you are and how been, where you are in your career as a director, there's always that one day on set that you feel that the entire world is coming crashing down on you. Something's not working. You're losing the sun. Uh, you know, something breaks down, some sort of craziness. What was that day for you? What happened? And how did you overcome it? Well, <clears throat> many that there, there were two of those I have to pick now. <laughs> um, one for sure was when our DOP Guillermo um, hurt hurt his knee really badly. Oh wow! And had to leave set, um, and we had to make a decision about you know how long is that going to be? What are we continuing? And we 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 transformed the day into a memory unit. Um, and then a few days later, we had to work with another DOP who came in um, to, to support that time until Guillermo could come back. So that was something where, you know, you really think like, oof, I'm losing um, a super important creative partner here. And yet it worked. Um, or the day when we said, well, it's a pandemic, we stopped shooting now. 
Did yeah. that happen? Did that happen? You, yeah. Did you have to stop shooting because of the pandemic? Oh yes. Oh, oh yes. And uh, after six weeks, so we had shot half a film. Oh. And it was the decision we have to stop now. It's a global pandemic. The world's closing down. Borders are getting shut. It's March fifteenth, um, twenty twenty, and oh. and we started. Of course, editing what we had so far, sure. but we were in the unknown. So we had no idea, well, is this a four week hiatus, an eight week hiatus? There were different scenarios, you know. We used the time creatively and also with what we edited, we made some changes on the script. Mm -hmm. So it was a blessing. There was a silver lining about it for sure, but it was really, well, how are we going to do that? Now we have to shoot the second half of the film in summer. Because we shot in Vancouver, so there are four seasons, you know. Yes, and there is. Yeah. If you know it and you watch the film, you will see that sometimes the trees have no leaves <laughs> at all, you know. And then next moment is blooming summer and it kind of pivots. And we really had to put so much minutiae planning into everything to make sure you will not see a pre and a post COVID when you see the film. It will still work as one. And that means that Sandy has to run around in her winter coat. Um, in, in summer? Yeah, in 100 degrees, you know. Poor thing. <laughs> and and, the, and then we film with the camera that there is one tree that is already getting a little bit red and that is right behind her. So we can create at least a subconscious illusion of autumn. And yeah, like that, I could I, continue now for a long time. I mean, was... so I'll tell you, I, it did not. I, so don't worry, it didn't, I didn't see it. And if I if I didn't see it, I'm you know I, you know how filmmakers are when we watch movies we'll start picking and poking at things, right. but yeah. I was so enthralled with the story that I didn't see any of that. And also the color grading and the lighting, it, it's just such a beautifully shot film. I didn't see that. Sometimes you do see that in movies, like something happens, like oh there's snow now there's no snow. What's going? Yeah. <laughs> you know it, it ha I've gone through the exact same problem. <laughs> My things. Wow. I'm I'm glad and also like all of a sudden, you know, you can't bring people together anymore. Like we couldn't we couldn't have any big group of extras. So how do you direct a scene when every extra has to be six feet apart? So then you start putting extras in little pods and start casting families, you know, that you create an, an illusion that it doesn't feel too spread out. And then, of course, the actors in the scene without masks, they could only come 15 minutes per day closer than six feet. So it's a whole challenge that you have to encounter in order for everybody to be safe. Like, okay, mm -hmm. we have 15 minutes. How do we stage the scenes that there is a physical distance all the time or we transfer scenes to the outside so that, you know, I, in the end, it feels still natural. So, yeah, because I, and I know the scenes you're talking about, um, you know, especially the stuff in the fish market, at least they could have masks on in the fish market. So that was... A <laughs> And that was pre-COVID. Oh, of course it was. Why wouldn't it be pre-COVID? And then, <laughs> the then you see those masks and you're like, put them up your nose, guys. You know, that's yeah. how we, that's how I, when I see it now, I'm like, why are they wearing their mask here? Oh yeah, right. Because it was pre-COVID. So, so I have to ask, you know, you, you, you you've got the, your big shot. You're working with Sandy and you're working on a big Hollywood movie. And then all of a sudden, the world has a once in a generation pandemic that stops you psychologically as a director, as a creative, as an artist in the middle of that situation. How, I mean, you're not the only director that went through this, by the way, but how did you, how did you handle it? Like for those weeks? And I know you were working on other stuff, but like at a moment you're like, oh my God, my shot is like, the whole thing is coming crashing down. When are we going to get back? I mean, I, all these thoughts had to have gone through your head. How did you handle those thoughts? On a day-by-day -day basis, I don't have a recipe for it. And the good thing is I wasn't alone in it, you know. Sure. I mean, it was a whole, it was us as a whole team. It was, you know, Sandy Graham. It was Netflix. It was um, Stefan, the editor, and me at that time. Like, we were like, okay, how can we make this work? It was a line producer always, like, planning different scenarios. So we were together in this in a way, and that helped me a lot. Yeah. You know, it's not just on me that we make it back up, but um, yeah, it, it sounded wild. it sounded like you had a lot of support, and and everybody was in this together, so that's great. Um, yeah, because yeah, I could imagine, 
I, I can't even imagine. <laughs> That's getting that shot, and all of a sudden, yeah. How long were you out, by the way? How long? Well, how long was that hiatus before you got in shooting again? End, it was five months. Five months. Yeah. So we stopped in mid March, and we came back in September. Jesus. Oh my God. But I mean, like you said, it was a blessing. You got to re-edit stuff. You got to rework the script. I mean, that's all you could do. <laughs> exactly. That's, and you did what you could. And that's what we had to do. Yeah. Now, there were some scenes in the film that are extremely e emotionally, uh, you know, intense emotional scenes. Do you have any tips uh, or suggestions for filmmakers who have to direct highly emotional scenes? How did you approach those scenes? takes uh you know how did you talk to the actors things like that well um in terms of talking to the actors again each actor is different and some need their space and others need a lot of attention so i think first of all you have to figure out through the process of getting to know them what do they need from me so I'm not blocking them, but help them to do their best of what they have inside. And sometimes it's hard to find the right balance of what's the one take that will be too much, you know, because certain emotional scenes, you shouldn't do too many takes because you will wear somebody out. But then... Sometimes you need that one more take to bring it over the limit, you know, and there is no recipe for it. It's just like being super, super alert and and conscious about the other person's well-being and asking, making sure what does he or she need from me right now. Mm -hmm. um, I like to easily rehearse a scene a day before. Um, not in full intensity of emotions, but mm -hmm. I like to go on the locations with the actors, that's what we did with the mediation scene, for example. Oh, yeah. That's what we did with the scene, um, the big crash scene from uh, Sandy and Viola. So we, and even if it's just like a read through, you know, like exploring the space, exploring the lines just a little bit, you know, um, and, and it gives time for everybody to process what's going to happen and there is enough time to ask all the questions because sometimes on set there isn't enough time and then actors still have a question but the whole crew is already you know yeah. running late and um it can put a lot of pressure unnecessary pressure in situations so if you do have time to rehearse a day before then great because then you can also start shooting that scene freshly you don't need to rehearse it on set anymore you just right. do one staging for the crew but you and your actors, you guys have already worked it out. Worked it out. Yeah, because there, yeah, there are some pretty intense scenes. That Viola and Sandy scene was, I mean, you could just feel Sandy. You could feel, yeah. you could feel the emotion coming from her. It was remarkable. So now that you've done uh, a big Hollywood uh, movie, what was the biggest lesson you took away from that big Hollywood movie? What's that one lesson you're like? I'm putting this in the I'm putting this in the toolbox and taking this with me for for the rest of my travels. <laughs> oh, for sure. And so many things and I think this is also an experience that will probably looking back every year I will look back and oh, yeah. see differently, you know, because it was so different from the world that I come from and um it's 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 almost too much at the same time to process in order to say that's the one thing I definitely learned to let go and just concentrate on my world, be, uh, on my work. Because coming from the low budget area, everybody does 10 jobs at the same time. And you kind of, you know, mix in everything and you want to kind of control everything. So the benefit of working with so great people and such a big team and everybody knows exactly what they're doing is like, okay, I can actually relax and lay back and just focus on my work, which is directing that film, which is character work, character work and character work. And of course, you know, camera and visuals and all that, but it really comes down to the human story in it. And I think I even, you know, you can take that into other words of saying, I trust that the people know what they're doing and I don't need to micromanage. Right. I'm better off focusing on the directing. 
Now, on your journey as a director, you know, when you were when you were doing those underground short films and not telling your family about it and all these kind of things, was I have to believe that there were moments of failure along the way. Um, yeah. How did you in those early those early days uh, when you were coming up? How did you overcome those uh, those initial failures, which are when you're starting out so much harder to take those punches than when you are a little bit more seasoned and you're used to those punches? Uh, how did you overcome those? Good question. <laughs> I guess with time and then. I mean, so many times I I was at a point where I'm like, maybe I should do something else, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in life. It's just too crazy or maybe it's just not working out. But, but um, then there is something that just keeps you going. And I don't know how to define that. Or again, there is no conscious recipe. But with system pressure, I mean, there were many times where I thought, like, this movie is never going to get made. We're never getting it financed. You know, what? it's like, cool. But but somehow the, the story really moved me. And then I continued working on it. And sometimes I had to take a break. But I was really sure that... I would miss that film in the world if it wasn't there. You know, I really thought like somebody has to do it and if nobody else does it, well, I guess I have to do it then. Right. So um, that kept me going. And um, I think definitely it's healthy to have a certain balance. You know, my kids helped me a lot um, to understand that, yes, you know, when you do a movie, you think this is the most important thing of the world, but it's not. It's just a movie. You know, you still have to go... <laughs> And get your kids make make some dinner for them, and that is as important. And that is also a healthy balance to overcome failures, because then you're like, well, you know, my kids love me no matter what, even right. if I make the, the worst movie on the on the planet, they 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 will still like me. And that is that is a pretty cool feeling. And and kids do definitely give you perspective on life, because uh, yeah. and if you get a little too high high on the hog, as they say, uh, you. Uh... <laughs> They will bring you down very quickly, <laughs> to back back down to earth. Uh, now I'm going to ask you a few questions. Ask all of my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Have a long breath. It takes time. <laughs> brace you your, have an over mind. Brace yourself is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Let letting go and relax. <laughs> and not macromanage. Let just roll with the flow. Go go with the flow a yeah. little bit. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride because it's going whether you want to or not. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's yeah. it's gonna go. As much as we try to go the other way, it, something keeps pushing us in the way that we need to go. Uh, and three of your favorite films of all time. Oh wow! Oh wow! Uh, um, so there is a there is a Korean film Binjip called Three Iron by Kim okay. Ki-duk. Okay. I love, love, love that film. Um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I think. Yeah. Classic. It's, 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 it's a film I, I end up watching, yeah, because I just love unlikable characters that are charismatic. <laughs> you know, they're definitely Ruth Slater and Benny from Sisters and Crasher have something in common with him. Um, and then This is England, a film by Shane Meadows, mm-hmm. is, is a film that I really loved. It's, uh, yeah. I probably have to add Wings of Desire also. From oh, Avengers. so wonderful. Oh, that is a film that moved, yeah, it moved me so much. Just the atmosphere, you know. I have still until today, I don't know what the plot is, but I just, uh, like, those, those two angels wandering through that partly destroyed Berlin, you know, that is oh. something... Yeah, um, it was. It's a stunning, stunning, stunning movie. Everyone should definitely. I, I God, I haven't seen Wings of Desire in forever. I have to go watch it again. Um, and when is uh, when is the Unforgivable coming out? It's coming out uh, on December tenth on Netflix and in certain theaters on um, November twenty fourth. Nora, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, and I wish you nothing but continued success. In, in the business and, and in your career. And uh, thank you for making such a, uh, uh, just a very heart-wrenching, but wonderful, uh, wonderful film. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. Hope to speak again. <laughs>